be going to have Robert Clark giving us a little bit of demonstration and talk about the legal aspects of cybersecurity. Enjoy. Get rid of that. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, legal aspects of cybersecurity, computer network operations, computer network security. Uh, basically, this is where law and technology intersect. Uh, I'm always pleased to so, see so many folks uh, from the computer security profession interested in this intersection. As a matter of fact, I, I made this comment to Marcus Sachs that I'm always pleased to see how many people actually will come to this presentation. And Marcus responded, yes, that or all the other rooms were filled up and they had no place to go. Um, and, and so here you are. So on, on that note, if you are here because you're curious about that intersection, uh, thank you. I'm uh, glad to see you. And if you're here because the other rooms have filled up, I apologize, and I'll talk to Jeff about that to get bigger rooms next time. Uh, I need to give a disclaimer. Uh, being a government employee that I am, uh, I am here speaking on my own behalf. Um, the views I have here do not represent any entity, person, or anything in the U.S. government, nor do I think that they would want uh, to take responsibility for my views. Um, so they are all my own. Uh, they want me to say, please uh, fill out those feedback forms. Um, I will caveat that as an attorney. Um, if it's something positive about me, by all means, please fill them out and turn them in. If it's not, then please conveniently lose them. <laughs> the agenda today. Um, legal aspects of computer network security is, is such a huge field, and you can pick so many topics to go on this. I, I have to kind of balance where, where we're going to go for this. So what I try to do is I, I pick the recent court cases that are going on that highlight more of the nefarious activity, things that you'd want to do if you're so inclined to go in that direction, that you'd want to know, huh, that's a good point. Maybe I shouldn't do that in case I'm going down that path. But then for the computer security professional, I, I wanted to work in some lessons learned because doing computer network security it, it requires multiple disciplines. And what I mean by that is you'll have law enforcement, you will have your computer emergency response teams, your certs, all working together on this. And so the lessons learned, I kind of apply some of the aspects where you can run afoul of things uh, on that. So I get both your, your criminal element, some information, and, and the practitioner aspects on it. And then look at some of the cases that have happened over the last year. At any time, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, that's kind of what we're here for to talk about. Um, however, uh, please watch the gotcha questions. I, I know you're all very smart um, on, on that. And if you're going to use your case, you know, do the hypothetical. Uh, a friend of mine was doing this, this, and this. Uh, so is, is there are people in, uh, around here listening to you. Um, and, and yes, if you must ask that, that, that one gotcha question to show you know, how smart you are and, and catch me off guard, um, I will say, you know, that just takes a lot of chutzpah. Uh, and I can say chutzpah, which I guess makes me uh, a, a better candidate for, for presidency than someone else. And I know who John Quincy Adams is um, on that. Uh, so my background, um, and I probably know who John Quincy Adams is because my dad's a Bostonian and, and was born in Quincy. So that's, that's probably all it takes. Um, I've been in this for about a decade now. I started out with the Army uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, the Army CERT. Um, from there, did some time up with Navy CIO, jumped up to DHS, was with uh, the U.S. CERT as their legal advisor, and then worked on the Assistant Secretary's staff um, doing information oversight and compliance. And when we stood up our three-star command for the Army un under U.S. Cyber Command, they hired an, I needed an operational lawyer, and I, I hightailed it back to a world that uh, I absolutely enjoy. For those of you who speak code, um, there's the background. Um, another disclaimer of sorts. Um, I can give this presentation in 20 minutes. Uh, I can talk fast, and you can listen slow, and, and be out of here. Um, that's the aspect of, we're slotted for an hour, and, and, and a town with one attorney can make a decent living. Um, a town with two attorneys can make a fortune. Um, and the reason behind that is, if, if you ask an attorney what one plus one is, you know, they'll say, what do you want it to be? Um, and, and so what I'm saying on that is, you ask the same question of different lawyers, you're going to get different answers. We're going to cover some of the court cases that came out here, and I'm going to tell you what the court cases said. We're going to look at some lessons learned, and I'm going to tell you my interpretation from that. A lot of the lessons learned are red flags that if you're going in that direction and you're doing these things, that's a, kind of a key for you to say, God, there was that, that lawyer dude, he, he, he was somewhere, he said, if I'm doing this, maybe I should talk to my attorney. And that's kind of the aspect of it. Um, who here knows what that acronym at the bottom stands for? I'm hearing it. You guys, they're good. I am not your lawyer uh, on that one, and, and which kind of takes us to the next aspect. 
I, I do, when I come here, I have the million dollar giveaway for the best question, best comment, or best heckle. Um, I have my Caesars chips up here, uh, three $5 chips and a 25, and being a lawyer, this is a million dollar giveaway. Best question, comment, or heckle, I, I, I will give you one of these chips. It's your responsibility to go out into the Caesars and turn it into a million dollars. So uh, I, I'm at. Being a lawyer, I, I will take a third of it if you do that. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, I'll keep my eye on you for that. Um, I have to caveat some things, even though I'm in a personal capacity. Um, if you're from a prohibited source and you ask a good question, then I can't give it to you because I'm with the government. That's not true. Um, and if you're with the media and you ask a good question, again, I can't give it to you because you're, you're supposed to ask good questions. All right, what's going on? Here we go. Hey, uh, you know, I, I, and, uh, so I've got some of my clients here, and, 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 I, and I say at the end, how to use a lawyer. And, and that one is, yes, insert your favorite joke right here. So, okay, so, so, so you, you know, you got your aspect going there. Um, and final thought before I begin um, on this. Um, and, and I, was, I actually had, I, I did have to research who the hell uh, Barkley was the vice president. I was like, wow. Um, so you need to be intelligent, well-educated, and a little drunk. However, I can be stupid, uh, dumb, and, and very drunk. <laughs> Jeff is keeping me on my toes. Um, when I, I ran into him back uh, in March at Georgetown, and he was doing a lunchtime presentation for the crowd there, and he was asked um, about the word hacker. Uh, and then, sure enough, a couple days ago, he's on uh, CNN Tech in a video, and they asked him again about the word hacker, and, and keeping me on my toes again. I'm looking at the news reports just two days ago, and in print, again, they asked him about the word hacker. And consistently, he says, you know, it, it, it's not negative. It's meant to represent a certain skill set, and, and that's exactly what the, the courts found out. Um, Mr. Prockner was uh, convicted of uh, possessing 15 unauthorized credit cards, and when he got arrested, um, he had the right to remain silent, but unfortunately, he did not have the ability to remain silent. <laughs> so um, a red flag... One, um, if you're ever arrested and, and, the right, and the cop reads you your Miranda warnings, um, do you wish to waive your rights? Purely from an EFF type perspective on this, your answer should be uh, no. Um, now, if, 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 it's, you know, if you're talking to the uh, U.S. attorney in the prosecutor's office, they'll always say, oh, sure, yes, go ahead. Um, but Mr. Progner could not keep his mouth shut and gave quite a detailed statement about what he was doing. So in his case, the court said, hmm, all right, we're going to enhance your sentence by two levels because you have special skills. Um, and, you know, on this one, they define what is special skills and the categories that, that hold special skills. And it's interesting to note that they list in there now computer network security professionals, lawyers, and, and demolition experts. Um, kind of an interesting combination in there. Um, it does not require formal training. It can be self-taught. Uh, so from that aspect, that's how uh, Mr. Prockner found out about it. And, and on appeal, he wanted to argue, hey, these weren't special skills. Anybody could do this. Um, and he gave a detailed statement listing what he did. I, and it's funny to go back and read these things, because if you go back and look at the case and what he did, given where uh, the computer security profession has come, uh, it, it's almost uh, laughable that you could argue, yeah, any script kitty could do this. Is that really a special skill? But be that as it may, they, they lifted his sentence uh, uh, two aspects. So a quick test to make sure you are a hacker or, or you are a geek. Um, do you laugh at jokes you hear on security podcasts or like Risky Business or TNT? Um, do you know that Risky Business is a, is a podcast and TNT doesn't mean dynamite? And, and the really, the, the big test I have for this one um, is that when you saw the movie The Social Network, were you like really laughing at the hacking part, vice like the naked girls doing bong hits at the end of the movie? Um, you know, I got to admit, I talked to a couple of guys and I'm like, yeah, when they're hacking up front, that was really cool. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're definitely a hacker. And by the way, I, I think it's chic to be geek. Um, it, you know, I, I, I try to learn this technology as much as possible. So the last year, we've seen Google running around um, getting sued uh, for their street view aspects on life. Um, and they, uh, in their case, they filed a motion to dismiss their lawsuit. Now, a motion to dismiss uh, is simply this. If you're suing me, um, I stand up in front of the judge, the defendant, and I say, Judge, I want you to look at the facts in the light most favorable to the other side, to the plaintiffs here, and I want you to assume everything they've pled in their complaint is true. It won't dispute it at all. Everything's true. And if the judge looks at it and says, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. And then I say, if you assume that's all true, they can't win. You need to dismiss the case. I don't even need to go before a jury on this case. 
So that's what they filed the motion to dismiss here. And the judge came back and said, I want you to further define uh, radio communications uh, as an exception to the wiretap statute. And so they came back and they rebriefed that aspect. Now, Google's attorneys did exactly what I would do. They cited this case um, where the uh, law enforcement folks hopped on a, an unsecure wireless router um, and, and grabbed information, and there's no Fourth Amendment violation or Electronic Communication Privacy Act, ECPA, violation on this one. So I thought, wow, I'm smarter to be a Google attorney. Um, well, it didn't work. Um, the judge denied the motion to dismiss, so the case will go to the jury. The difference between the two cases, again, looking at those facts most favorable to the plaintiff. In this case, the plaintiffs pled that Google used custom design software I think this crowd's going to like this aspect on it. Custom designed software for the capture storage of wireless signals and data. The data collection system is commonly known as a packet analyzer, wireless sniffer, network analyzer, packet sniffer, or protocol analyzer. The key thing on this one that hung up on this case is, is this technology that's commonly available to the public in, in, in the general use? Now, if I get all you folks on my jury, um, and I say, you know, this is commonly available stuff. Everybody's got it in their basement. Well, hey, I'm going to win that lawsuit because you probably all have that sitting on shelves in different parts in your house. Um, but to, to the world out there at large, um, the judge, you know, dismissed, you know, denied the motion aspect and said, we're going to let this go to a jury to see where it goes. In the um, uh, Errant case, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the interesting aspect of Errant um, it is the fact of a lot of times when you get a law decision, there's what's the issue, what did the judge decide? And that's the main holding of the case that us lawyers are going to use when we cite the subsequent cases. But we also get what's called dicta, um, and that, which is other comments that the judge will make on that that I can use later on down the road. And in this case, I mean, again, we're looking at the, the application of the Fourth Amendment to uh, you know, the Internet age. You know, it's an open question. It's, it's huge. Quan, we're going to talk about because they made it to the Supremes. So, so we'll talk about that. And this issue case was you know, the expectation of privacy uh, that he had on his shared iTunes library uh, for his unsecured home wireless. I like the way um, you know, basically life interacts with, with things. Um, I had to brief at the executive session, and I wanted to use my iPad, too, and, and going out, um, it would not come up on a screen. You Google it, you find out, okay, it has to do a factory reset. I was at a, you know, a mall, so I went into the Apple store, the Genius Bar. By the way, this, this is not a vendor aspect on life. Question? Uh, yeah, sorry, just to clarify, so if it's on an unsecured wireless network, it's considered the same for the Fourth So, so the question is, if it's on your unsecured wireless network, it's considered the same as being out on your front lawn. Hold that. Make sure I answer it. Let me get back, because that's part of the decision on that. This was kind of the distinction between what Google was doing and what this one was. Um, oh, hell. Um, okay. The aspect on this one was the unsecured wireless network that he had and the way he configured his iTunes account, which is where I was just going. Give me 30 seconds, and you get the answer. So I'm in the Genius Bar having this thing reconfigured, and all of a sudden, Everybody's freaking shared libraries coming up, and I'm about to punch on one thinking, whoa, wait a second, that was the child porn case that I have to talk about at Black Hat. I'm not touching that. <laughs> but, but that's the aspect. Because he configured it, or actually by default didn't configure it, he's broadcasting his share iTunes library out, so when the gal brought up her iTunes account, there it was. So from that aspect, you, you've configured it to share it out there, public domain, Cops can look at it, no Fourth Amendment expectation. So going with that on what you said there, um, you'll see from court cases, usually when you're reading them, which I'm sure we all do, because we have nothing better to do, um, judges will give you clues on where the decision's going because us, I'm going to let you know a little secret. Us lawyers, we're not the smartest species on the planet. We went to law school because we couldn't do math. Um, the only math, again, we know how to do is take a third. So judges will start giving us a clue um, of where they're going because they're older than we are, uh, not much more older than, than I am because like, I'm the oldest one in the room. Um, on, on that note, they will kind of lead us along a path of where they're going. So when you read this qu uh, question, you, your opinion, you start saying joyriders. You know, they think it's legal, accidental, unauth unauthorized, ubiquitous. You're like going, okay, this is not going to go well for Aaron. I mean, he's, he's going down this path. Um, for a Fourth Amendment violation, you have to have two things. You have to have a subjective belief or expectation in privacy and one that society will recognize a, a, as objectable. And, and from that uh, objective, and from that aspect, 
it came out of um, a, you know, an aspect of case law from way back when. And so in this case, um, again, going back to the unsecured wireless network and the way he configured it or the lack of configuring it, um, he was broadcasting out there and he said, society's not going to recognize this as an expectation of privacy, so the law enforcement is just fine going and grabbing this information. Um, so that's how that case came out of that. The difference, again, with the Google case is they pled facts to say, I've got an unsecured wireless network here. I'm communicating out to the Internet. I have not configured that as, a, as to be open where anyone in, that's in the general you know, public domain can access that and look at it. So that will go to, um, to court on that or for a trial. Um, these are some recent cases that just came out uh, that I wanted to talk about. The U.S. v. Hicks, um, and I'm a Michigan graduate, so I'm going to go right to Frick, Ohio State University. Um, Frick, anything that says Frick OSU, I'm all over that. Well, Miss Frick OSU, um, she's smarter than Proctor um, on this one. So she's charged with uh, real estate fraud transactions, and she got busted, and cops came in, searched their residence, took the laptops away and everything. Not only is she smart enough that when they read her her Miranda rights and invoked them, she's smart enough to encrypt her hard drive, or well, allegedly her hard drive. Um, EFS, EFF has filed a, an amicus in this case, um, and so the court did what, you know, the prosecution did what prosecutors do. Um, under the All Writs Act, they uh, asked the court to compel Ms. Frick OSU, and it might be a Frickuso, um, to either type in her encryption passphrase um, or give them an unencrypted hard drive. Um, now, the case cites Boucher, and I spoke about this case when I was here last. Um, Boucher was coming across the Canadian border and had his laptop in the back, and so the cops directed him to a secondary inspection. They opened it up. It, it was on. They saw 14 images of child porn. And being good cops, they immediately shut it down, closed it down, and went and got their search warrant so they could search it. Because cops are good at that. I'll go get a search warrant, I'll shut it down. But they weren't smart enough to realize that when they shut it down and they booted it back up, that the partition was encrypted from where all the child porn was. So now they couldn't get to it. And so they wanted his passphrase, or him to type it in, uh, for that, and they filed a motion to uh, suppress uh, based on a violation of his Fifth Amendment, and he won. And so, again, the prosecutors do what prosecutors do. They appealed it. Um, and, and the distinction here is, is this testimonial in nature? And if I have a safe uh, up on the wall, and, and it's got a key to it to go in there, and the government says, produce that, I have to produce that because that's not testimonial in nature. It's a key. Does a key exist? Yeah, it, it, it exists. So courts have ruled that's not testimonial nature. The safe's on the wall with a combination lock on it, and I, they say, what's the combination? Now I'm giving them information, testimony, of, that I have knowledge of what that combination is, which implies that I know what's in the safe. Particularly if I'm searching a house and there's four people in there, and I'm the only guy that knows the combination, okay, now I've narrowed it down. I know what's in there. Now, in Boucher, he, he did have to turn over the passphrase um, for, or actually he provided an unencrypted hard drive on that. A um, couple aspects in that case. They, they said, you know, the cops know the evidence is there. They saw the 14 images. The cops know it's his computer, because he said, yeah, that's my computer. So they had a couple more facts on that. I have problems with the fact of, yeah, there's 14 images in there. I, I don't know if there's 14 or 1,400. So I, I still kind of thought that was a, a stretch on that, but he, he turned it over on that. In the Frick OSU case, th they don't know that. They don't know whose computer it is because they seized it and there are four people living there. So she never said, that's my computer. They don't know the evidence is there. So from that aspect, again, there are other facts in this case. What you know, I, I like about this, uh, this particular case, um, and by the way, up in uh, Michigan, go blue, um, in March 2010, uh, Thomas Kirshner, a case up there, he was facing child pornography charges up there. Same thing, he was uh, being compelled to give his password, and that court said, no, we're not going to have you uh, give up your password on that. So there's precedent out there on the good side for, for giving up your passwords. Attorneys are allowed to strike fair, hard blows. You're, you, you advocate for your client you know, in, in a hard you know, fashion, uh, but courts have always said, but don't strike below the belt. So the Justice Department just filed their brief in response to EFF's amici, and uh, in it they say, Hey, EFF acknowledges in there, know your rights, that a judge may tell you to turn over your passphrase. You know, that wasn't, that's not fair. I mean, that, that's, as a lawyer, I'm going to, you know, if we have time and I get to my side, I'm going to say words matter. 
in the guide, which is their guide, that's correct. A judge may try to compel you to, to turn over your passphrase. It's not shall or will, it's may. I mean, so basically they, they were great at, at, at stating the absolute obvious of what those words were. Um, an interesting little shot by DOJ trying, trying to get at, at EFF for that. Um, good old Hicks. Um, Hicks is, is, is actually um, with Mr. Proctor. Um, he's not smart. He, he, he didn't know, uh, again, the, uh, have the ability to remain silent. This case starts out like a bad Ron White joke. Um, Ron White's a comedian from Blue Collar Comedy Tour, my kids love, and he's performing down the road here. Um, two cops show up at the house of a 35-year-old male who lives with his parents. When this is the beginning of your fact pattern, nothing good is going to come from this. <laughs> So, the joke continues. They knock on the door. The, ki the kid, sorry, hey, he's a kid to me. Um, the kid, because like the only other person who's older than me here is like Ron Beckstrom, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, on that. So, the kid's not home, and so, of course, the parents invite the cops in, which is what typically happens. Again, nothing good's going to come from this. So, they talk to the parents, and they leave their business card, which effectively says, Hi, I'm the lead child porn investigator for this state. Please have your son come talk to me. All right. Now, outside of the fact that, you know, like Jeff said, we all agree child porn's bad. If anybody, if a cop ever shows up and says, please come talk to me, uh, you know, again, I, I think from an EFF perspective, your answer's probably no. Um, Mr. Hicks wasn't that smart. Mr. Hicks was incredibly stupid, but the facts are great. So he decides to go down the next day to talk to the cops. And they ask him, is there child porn on your computer? And again, not having the ability to remain silent? Yes. So they ask the next question. May we have your hard drive? Unbelievably, the guy says, uh, no, I destroyed it. Um, and it's like, not only do you say how he destroyed it, but yeah, I, I took a hammer to it. <laughs> I've done this. Uh, I took a hammer to it, ran magnets all over it. I, I haven't done this part. And, and threw it out the window as I was driving down here. Um, and so, so the cops are like now left with, we know you, you're involved in child porn, and you've got to love cops, and you've got to love prosecutors. They can't charge them with child porn, so what are they charging with? A violation of a, okay, wait, wait, I got, I got to ask. This is, this is a $25 question, and if you have, I've talked to you about this before, I disqualify you. What did they charge him with? Littering. What? Littering. Littering. I like that. <laughs> but it was too many people said that. That would have been a good one. Um, no, they charged him with a violation of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now, <laughs> if, you had, if you had asked me that, and you said, hey, they charged him with a violation of the Sox Act, I would have gone, what the... Uh, if you would have said, how do they do that? I would have said, I have no freaking idea. Uh, and, and I did not realize that under that act, whoever knowingly destroys tangible evidence related to a crime, you can be charged with that. And I thought, what a classic. So, you know, a lot of times it's that aspect of, you know, the Al Capone thing. I can't get you here, but, but I'm going to get you over here. Um, absolutely uh, uh, amazing to me. Um, in the last year, um, the White House sent their legislation to the Hill uh, that they're proposing uh, to have passed. Uh, ironically, in this uh, that people are saying uh, is not in here, um, they did not uh, include in there to make the cyber czar um, requiring uh, Senate uh, confirmation for it and elevate it to, to that status. Um, so it still doesn't require Senate confirmation, so he's still just a, a czar, whatever that means. Um, and the, the key thing they did here, uh, coming from, from DHS, was when DHS does cybersecurity for the, for the .gov, um, right now the authority to do for each executive and department re re rests with the executive head under the uh, Federal Information uh, FISMA, uh, Security Management Act. And they're supposed to, by statute, hire a CIO, and they do security, cybersecurity for each department and agency, and they do it how they see fit. And the way they're doing it right now for, for DHS is we do it through uh, an agency relationship. Uh, DHS goes out and says, hey, do you, do you need help uh, doing your, your computer security? The agency says, yeah, we do. Why don't you come in here, deploy an Einstein II for me. Thank you very much. They sign a memorandum of agreement, and away they go. In that memorandum of agreement is the sharing of information that, that will come across that intrusion detection system on that. And there are a lot of statutes across the board there on how different government agencies can share information on that. And since, you know, you're never sure what it's going to alert on and that information that's going to be captured in, in the intrusion detection system, that was raising some kind of issues. And so the, the, uh, the proposed legislation was supposed to take care of the aspect of having them have positive authority to go out and, and do computer network security for the federal government, get the information that's in there. 
The interesting note in this one is um, typically government agencies don't want to have another government agency have any kind of approval aspects on there. And so as part of this, um, DHS is supposed to come up with oversight procedures for the handling of the information, and it needs to be approved by the Attorney General, which is kind of an interesting aspect on that. Uh, so they have oversight procedures in there. They have sections in there dealing with uh, critical infrastructure and things, um, and you know, the center's there, and the protect privacy is always a key factor in that. From what I've heard in open source, nod, nod, wink, wink, um, the legislation, a lot of people like it, um, it's just not, it's moving, uh, if you saw Mudge's talk earlier, it's moving at governmental speed, um, which means by about this time, uh, a decade from now, um, we should have uh, some kind of wording or ruling on it. It's not moving, and you're going to go into it, you're already kind of in an election year, so as you're going towards an election year, you're probably not going to see too much movement on that. Um, at the executive briefing, I said if you did, I'd, I'd buy you a beer. There's too many people in here for me to buy a beer because I'm just a cheap government employee. Cybersecurity lessons learned. Um, all right, so uh, uh, you're a cybersecurity or a computer security professional. This is you, or, or maybe this is you, or, or maybe this is you. Now, the last group's not you, because if you're doing computer network security for a company, you're not happy, um, and you're not smiling um, <laughs> like these people. So th th that last group's not you. But you're monitoring your system. And um, as monitoring your system, you see a, a nice little FTP connection come on into you. It's going somewhere into the HR department. You notice that it appears to be a, a large exfil of data, um, and, and so you're concerned what to do. And you think about it, you know, it, it's happening at the time, it always happens, you know, it's, it's you know, the wee hours in the morning, and, and you're sitting there, you're the only one there, and you're thinking, eh, it's the HR department, oh hell, it's probably only personally identifiable information, what do I care? So you go back to playing Portal, you know, Portal 2 or Call of Duty, or trying to figure out what the hell happened to the $500,000 you had in Bitcoin, so it's now disappeared. Um, and I, again, Jeff said, if you notice any vendor endorsements in this to speak up, I had this presentation done a long time ago. The fact that Call of Duty and, and the zombies are in this one, and, and there happens to be a vendor here that's dealing with zombies and actually had people playing Call of Duty Black Ops, in no way endorses that product whatsoever. Actually, I picked these because this is what my 14-year-old's doing all summer long is killing Nazi zombies. Not that I ever thought I would be at a conference saying Nazi zombies, but such is life. So, uh, you know, you're not concerned about personally identifiable information. Let's change the facts on you. It goes into the research and development section. You got a lot of proprietary information going on there. The next big thing's coming out, and it's gone. And now we're thinking, okay, facts are different. Uh, uh, my, let, let's, be, let's be honest. So you see this happening. What's going to happen? Your ass is going to be fired if you tell the CEO this. So the stress level's kind of gone up. And I'm going to say right up front, as we're talking about this area, there are multiple disciplines. So, so when you see your logs happening here, and this happens, what is that? It's a crime. God, you guys could have got five bucks right there, just like that. When someone accesses your system and takes it out, that's unauthorized access, that's a crime. So you can report it to the cops. Now, but you don't want to report it because you're going to get fired if you do, um, one, once, once they hit it allegedly, maybe, um, on that. So you see that it's an anonymous FTP. You do your little research, it's out there, and you're thinking, okay, my, fires just got, my files just got exfilled. It's at an anonymous FTP. Hey, I can log into that and see what the hell's going on. Uh, yeah. Question? So now that, so if I got this, now that um, corporations are entities, private citizens, can you go back and do hack back for corporate self-defense? You know, so um, an interesting aspect on that. The anonymous FTP um, that it went to, that you're going to go log into, does that belong to the people who just exfilled your data? I'm a dumb lawyer. Hell, even they, my, my guys have told me that it's not. Um, again, because you're going to come in, offload it somewhere else. Well, first off, when you come in, download the tools, sit there, cut that, come back, oh, beacons out, you now have done the connection, offload it over here, cut that out, and come in there. Uh, you know, and a typical aspect on it. So you're, you're touching an FTP server that doesn't belong to the person, arguably, on that. So, um, you know, I've had, so now, if it's an anonymous FTP, I've actually had a debate with one other lawyer in the government. Um, it's a very, so it makes it an extremely minority view. 
what's truly anonymous? If I log in as Bob at AOL.com, password's password, and I'm in, you know, is that anonymous? I've had this debate with the individual. That's not anonymous. That's online undercover because you're not Bob at AOL, which, of course, I had to respond, no, actually, I am Bob at AOL. That's my name. Uh, and he goes, okay, fine. If you log in as Paul at AOL, I'm like, okay, well, I won't log in as Paul. Um, now, it's a very huge minority view. Again, from this aspect, if you're in a place that you have a right to be that's publicly available and accessible, uh, as far as, you know, from my aspect on it, you have a right to be there. But the question becomes, what is truly anonymous? Does it matter the location of the FTP server? You know, U.S., non-U.S., is it a private company? So let's go back to the gentleman who says, I'm going to hack back to this. So what if it's a private company and they don't know they're hosting that FTP server? What if someone's hacked their system, set it up there for the malware and, and the whereas to go there for that aspect of it so you can go in there? So now if I go logging into there, I mean, that's a private company, even though it's an anonymous FTP, it is a protected computer, so if I violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what that... U.S. attorney who has jurisdiction over that is going to say. Now, one other aspect. So, as you know, I go and log into that. Oh, hey, there's logs. It's going to see me coming. So you think, wait, I don't want to come from my employer's uh, computer system. I'll do a VPN to my home account and go there, or I'll use a proxy so they can't, you know, log me in from coming from there. All right, that's a red flag. If you're going to start going down that path, I highly suggest you start talking to your lawyer. Actually, I suggest you talk to your lawyer much earlier than that. So, what if it's not an anonymous FTP server? What if because of your information, your forensics that you've got there, you notice what the login and the password is, and you're going to use that to protect your proprietary interests, and you're going to go log into that FTP server using that information and find out what's going on there? Well, you know something? You don't have the authority to do that. That's probably a violation of Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, count one. Very strong chance on that. Now, I was thinking about this as I, as I was doing my, uh, I was running through this, kind of rehearsing it. By the way, my rehearsals were much funnier. Um, so, uh, and I thought, okay, wait a second. I'm looking through my logs. I'm looking through my forensics. I've got the password, the login and the password here because that criminal came in, in, in a way, gave it to me. So why is that unauthorized now? It's kind of like he gave it to me. Yeah, as a defense attorney, that's the argument I would make for you. Um, again, it depends on more of the aspect of, of that prosecuting attorney. So let's say somehow you're on that FTP. So what are you going to do now? What do you want to know? Well, I think you're going to want to know what files were posted. Questions, comments? Um, so what files are posted? Uh, who's looking you know, at these files and copying them? You're going to probably want to know. Um, so you know, how do you do that? Where's that information you know, resident uh, there? Um, it's probably in the logs on the FTP server. but. My understanding, um, again, if I set up an FTP server and I've got a file tree where I'm posting all the files there, I make these all publicly available so people can access them, download them, and get them. Typically, I'm not making the logs accessible. I keep that behind the system um, as private. So what do you do? You elevate your privileges while you're on there so you can actually get the logs to see who's coming in, copying and grabbing it, and where they're going to so you can save the day, protect the data, delete the files, and you've saved your job. But when you elevated your privileges, that's probably count two of the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act on that one. Again, red flags to think about what's going on, why you're doing these things, and say, yeah, maybe I should talk to my lawyer before I start doing these things. So you got a CEO. You know, it might be this guy, or her, or him, or him, or, or, or even her. Uh, that, um, that was for my nine-year-old daughter. She's a princess. So you got your CEO. Um, he has a problem like all CEOs do. Um, employee productivity is down. Um, he wants to monitor the employee's internet usage. He's heard something about an SSL device. And uh, unfortunately, um, so has one of his employees who has decided to load certificate patrol on the system, and now he's in a lawsuit. Um, so the question becomes, you know, what are the warning signs on this one? I, I have some uh, cases we're going to talk about here a little bit later that talk about employer monitoring. You know, it's lawful. There are numerous precedents out there on how to do it. Um, you know, with your acceptable use policies, the banners you have on there, the training you're giving, you know, the main aspect on that is the notice that the employees have that this is going on. If you're going to use uh, Spectre Pro or an SSL type device, hey, I'm reasonably savvy from, from the information that you folks have, have, have parlayed on to me. I read my banner and I say, okay, I got no expectation of privacy whatsoever. I'm out there, I'm checking the basketball scores or whatever. Hey, I understand that aspect of it. Man, I log into my bank. Well, I don't log into my bank from, from my work computer. Um, I, I don't bank online. I keep my money in a mattress. Um, it's more secure. 
except it keeps going down, so I think my kids have found out where it's at. Um, but you know, from that aspect, if I log into my bank, SSL, HH, uh, HTTPS, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know that I'm actually thinking that that's, you know, my ex I got an expectation of privacy there. Um, so if you're going to do things like that, you got to give notice to your employees, hey, here's what we're doing and here's what we're using. So uh, on that, because, you know, there's methods to implement this with the whitelists that come with it, you know, not getting content information. And if you're going to start getting, you know, that PII stuff, you got to start looking at the retention aspects and protecting that. So there's a whole host of issues that can come up. Yes. Give me one more. What? Does the employee violate the company's accepted use policy? Okay. Hold that thought. We're going to talk about that in United States versus Nozzle because, oh, Jesus Christ. All right. United States versus Nozzle. Um, See, I got my notes over there, and I'm going to get things wrong because I'm not looking at my notes. Um, United States versus Nozzle was an interesting case because it deals with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge of exceeding authorities uh, on the case. A lot of commentators picked up on this because they're saying, you surf Facebook at work, we're going to charge you with a computer criminal crime of uh, computer fraud and abuse because you've exceeded or violated the use restrictions uh, of your employer. And, and it's like meaning, so again, if you're checking Facebook or the basketball scores, you're going to jail. And you know, that's not what the case stood for. It's specifically stated in the case, as a matter of fact, that's not what we're talking about. It recognized that there's, you know, people are saying, we're going to turn millions of users into criminals because they're surfing at work in violation of the use restrictions of the employer by doing that. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, if you violate the use restrictions and do it with the intent to defraud your employer, you could find yourself here. The facts of the case were uh, Nozo, being a good guy, um, worked for a company with three other guys, and of course they decide, we're going to go start the competing company, we're raiding the company files for all the customer information, and we're going to go start the competing company. Doesn't sound like a nice guy just checking basketball scores to me. Sounds kind of nefarious. Now, the problem here, and it was the, a, a case of first impression for the Ninth Circuit apparently, in civil suits that have come out for computer fraud and abuse, because if you violate you know, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I can civilly sue you on this, um, two lines of theory have come out on this. If I give you authority to use my computers on day one, and on day 100, you decide you're going to leave and form a competing company, raid my computer, computer files and go off, you have not exceeded your authorization because you had authority to be on my computer systems from day one you know, until you left. There's another school of thought that takes in the agency fiduciary duty relationship of agency law, which is the duty of loyalty. When I hire you, you have a duty of loyalty to me, and once you start breaching that, that's where that authority ends. And so you've got two competing aspects of, uh, of law going on out there. In this case, they applied the aspect of the, the breach of fiduciary duty with the intent to defraud and said, that's what we're going for this. We are not intending to criminalize the surfing of Facebook or checking of basketball scores. So from that aspect, breaching the use restriction, intent to defraud, you know, Mr. Nozell, you're heading off to jail. Uh, so that was the aspect of, of, of using it for that. Again, if you're going to be using this information, if you're going to be using this kind of stuff, Spectre Pro or SSL, I, again, I, I highly recommend that you give specific notification to your employees that you're using that type of device, that they have no expectation in any communication if you're really going to protect yourself. Question, question? So if the company owns the system, does the company all the, own all the data that's on that system? So if I, don't, if I don't have an acceptable use policy or a banner or anything like that, and I'm checking my web-based email on my employer system, and that's my stuff, and I've got to use the password to get into that, there's a court case out there that says I have an expectation of privacy in that. You haven't said that that's your data, so no, you don't own that. You can't monitor you know, You can always monitor it, but you can't grab it and can say it's company data. I can watch it going across the wire. Um, again, uh, there are case laws out there saying if you're not giving me notification uh, that, that you're doing that, that you could be you know, uh, intercepting and you could be in violation of the Electronic Communication Privacy Act. I think it's really weak. 
Again, I'm going to go back to the, no, 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 I can, I can monitor going across there. But the question becomes, if, I mean, if you're using an SSL um, or Spectre Pro and getting to that level, you better be giving your, your employees notice that you're looking at every single one and zero going across the pipe. Um, Sony. Uh, I, I don't want to put words into Jennifer Granick's mouth. She's talking after me um, on this. And uh, the jailbreaking aspect is really her foray. She, she, I think she handled it at, e, at EFF before uh, she headed off. Um, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more interested in this one from an aspect of class action negligence suits that the computer security practitioner field could be uh, facing. Another interesting aspect of this was the far-reaching aspects of discovery uh, that Sony got with the subpoenas to different ISPs, Facebook, Twitter, and PayPal. They had a jurisdictional dispute o over what was going on, and they really got a lot of information uh, uh, to handle that aspect of it before it settled. But I I'm a little more aspect uh, looking at the negligence aspect of that. If you're providing a services for computer network security, um, it's kind of an interesting aspect. Uh, in a tech podcast, they had a former cyber prosecutor, I, I don't know who it was, who said they, Sony had an imperative duty to secure their systems. I, I'm not sure that's the standard. Um, going back to first year law school negligence, um, negligence, when I see you for negligence, you have to have a duty that you owe me, you've had to have breached that duty, that breach has had to cause me the proximate cause of my harm, my injury, and I, and I had to have an injury. Um, the case out there right now that has been held that, that a bank was negligent for uh, uh, online banking is the citizen case here. Um, you know, the plaintiffs in this case had somebody log in with a different IP address, take some money from them. The bank said, no, we're, we're not, you know, going to, you know, have you, you, gotta, you owe us that money, so we're not going to pay you for that. Um, they cited their business online banking application that said they will have no liability uh, for unauthorized payments on this, and citizen, or the plaintiff sued for negligence. Um, again, life intersecting uh, and not being an endorsement because I'm reading it from here. Um, FISERV, F-I-S-E-R-V, um, who's here at the conference, provided their uh, online banking services, their uh, information security services to them. Both parties agree. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm vendor neutral. I'm reading um, that FISERV has a reputation in the banking industry for providing high quality services. So uh, it was one factor authentication. Uh, the plaintiff said, uh, you know, to protect our access on this, we should be past single-factor authentication. They, sh they, they said they, they should have given us a security fixture, something, something called a token. Um, I, I guess that means an RSA token, um, you know, so on that. Uh, uh, but, you know, they didn't do that. Plaintiff also said, we're going to cite this uh, 2005 document, which, given our field, that's ancient. Um, it's the authentication in an Internet banking environment. And it's authored by the Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, the FFIEC. It's an interagency body that provides um, a number of federal agencies standards for uh, regulation of financial institutions. And in this case, um, that regulation said, you know, you need more than single factor authentication. You need at least dual factor uh, authentication for this. So they said, bank, um, you are negligent. You, you, they, you have to give them their money back. Fast forward to Patco. Patco is a construction company. It's been in the news. They lost a great deal of money, and the bank, uh, the case got dismissed because they used dual-factor authentication on that. They cited the FFIEC report on it. that They were complying with it. And, of course, everybody's saying, now, here's the thing. On this case, Patco got hosed up by Zeus. And everybody said, you know, you're facing a different, it's a game changer now. This is different than what's going on. You've got to update these regulations. So come January 1st, uh, 2012, um, the FFIEC's guidance is changing in that banks need to have uh, anomaly detection software and risk management best practice. Hey, that's wonderful. It doesn't help Patco and all the money they lost out of this, um, but we've got these things coming down uh, the pike for that. Um, back to the Sony lawsuit for negligence and a breach. Um, Dr. Spafford testified at the House, so I've got this as open source. But if you're going to, things you need to think about, if you're going to prove a negligence case, the question is going to be, okay, what, what's the standard? What's the, what would a reasonably prudent person under like and similar circumstances do? Um, in this case, you're talking, you know, apparently their, their uh, servers were out of date, no firewalls. You know, it, it's easy if I can get someone to testify, hey, we're, we're a big company. Um, normally it's easy to get around to updating. We didn't do it. Um, so, you know, what's the standard to prove? And you're getting a lot of things out there as far as what a, a breach or what a standard should or, or, or may not be. Um, you know, with, with RSA, LastPass, HP Gary. You know, so what's going to happen is, you know, when someone sues you for negligence, if you're providing computer security services somewhere, it's going to be a battle of experts. Uh, us attorneys are going to take you techies and put you on the stand to testify what a reasonably prudent 
similar system administrator or computer security professional would do and provide under these circumstances. And, and, and here's the fun aspect. Um, I've heard, uh, you know, attorney, the definition of attorney is um, someone you pay a lot of money to to, to, to convince a jury that, that you're right um, on that. And that's what's going to happen. They're going to have their expert, you're going to have your expert, and we're going to present those facts in front of a jury um, that probably doesn't understand this technology that much, and they're going to decide the negligence standard. Cases from the last year. Um, I wouldn't have necessarily put these two in here, but I, um, I'm um, kind of uh, ethically obliged to mention the Supreme Court when, whenever we talk. Um, it's one of those things. So Quan made it to the Supreme Court. Quan was that case of employee monitoring, um, and I'm going to jumble the facts on the lower court and the lower holding. Um, suffice to say, they got to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court's going to do what it needs to do for ruling on uh, expectation of privacy um, on this. Um, Quan was given a, a text pager, he, and the fun part about this is he's a cop, upstanding citizen. Um, and so he's given a pager. There's the acceptable use policy that says all data belongs to you know, the government here. We can look at it for whatever we want. You have no expectation of privacy in this. Good to go, and away he goes. Um, a supervisor, uh, as part of it, said, look, you get to use it for so many text messages. Anything you do above that, as long as you pay for it and give me the money, no problem. Go ahead and use it that way. I'm not going to audit it. I'm not going to look at it. All right, the problem that happened there is it made it inconsistent with the policy. You just said all the governments are, or all the information belongs to the government, and you have a supervisor who just said, uh, hey, you know something, I'm not going to look at all this stuff over here. Go ahead and do that. And that's where it got hung up. Nobody would have noticed this except Quan was involved with a bunch of sex, improper sexual relationships, adultery, aspects on life. So he was undergoing another investigation because of that, a legitimate government interest, and, and so they started looking at his pager. So he, he said, you know, he sued and basically said, uh, you can't look at that, it's a violation. You know, one court said, yep, you're absolutely right, we, the government can't look at that. The government appealed to one of the other courts, they swung it back around and said, no, 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 they, they can. And then the other party appealed that up to the Supreme Court. So here it is, um, the aspects of what amount of privacy rights an employee has, has far-reaching effects, you, you Supremes are going to give you an answer. Um, the court does not resolve the party's disagreement over Quan's privacy expectations. Thank you so much. That's what we call in the legal field a Supreme Court punt. Uh, I, I mean, it's an aspect of thank you so much for, for, for avoiding the issue. Prudence counsels, and this is kind of the interesting aspect of, of a, a, recogni a recognition of technology. Prudence counsels caution before the facts of this case are used to establish far-reaching premises that define the existence and extent of privacy expectation in employee and employer monitoring. Rapid changes in the dynamics of communications in this technology uh, uh, say we should resolve this in a different way. So what they said was, Connor versus uh, uh, Ortega is the workplace search case that came out of the Supreme Court. And if you have a legitimate expectation for doing a search, then you may do that. If you find other aspects while you're doing it, they go back to, you had a legitimate reason to start it. That's what we're going to rule on. And so they punted the issue and they refused to, uh, they, they took the easy road out, which is arguably what the Supreme Court's supposed to do. Microsoft versus I4I. I'm not a patent attorney. Again, I'm not an engineer because I, I couldn't be an engineer. I'm not smart enough. Um, so I kind of stay away from the patent aspect of life. This made it to the Supreme Court. The, the reason I kind of like this was because at the lower level trial, I4I wanted the jury instruction, rightly so, given that if they want to invalidate this patent, they've got to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. And Microsoft wanted to prove it by preponderance of the evidence. And so they took this, it got to the Supreme Court, and they said, tracing nearly a century of case law, um, there's a presumption that it requires uh, that it must be by clear and convincing evidence. So I'm kind of surprised it's got to the Supremes. If there's a century of case law, you know, why are they taking it there? But, uh, you know, I guess Microsoft's got a lot of money, so away you go. Um, and, and, you know, and that's the aspect of it. Um, you might, you know, as we know from the patent disputes, as long as I got the litigation going, I, I might be able to work out a settlement over here before, you know, it, it finally comes to an end. Courts are realizing, you know, the breadth of computers and computer searches. And, and so they're starting to limit the, those aspects of it. In this particular case um, of, of the search warrant, um, believe it or not, I thought the steroid scandal in baseball was bad enough in baseball and that you've got us wasting thousands of dollars prosecuting Barry Bonds and, and Roger Clemens. What a waste of money. Don't we have better things to do? And now it's invaded the computer area. And actually, that's not a bad thing, because the cases that came out of that was called the comprehensive drug testing. They were so good, there's a one, two, and a three that follow it. 
Um, and so what those cases said was we're not going to allow overbroad and general uh, search warrants to go out there. Which, again, the reason behind this is when we give a search warrant under our Constitution going back to you know, the Revolutionary War times, we said we're not going to give just general search warrants to search for everything. They've got to be particular, specific to what we're seeking. Which I think, again, my understanding of search warrants from that aspect make me a better possible candidate for the Republican Party for president than several people who are out there. Be that as it may, I digress again. Um, in this case, in the comprehensive drug screening cases, they had these broad warrants, and some, judge, some uh, opinions came out of the Ninth Circuit, several of them, setting standards that have to be in place to narrow that down. And for computer searches, what that was is, you know, Kunis here was, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, he was charged with uh, counterfeit goods, Microsoft counterfeit goods. And Microsoft did what they were supposed to do. They bought them on Craigslist, bought them back, did the forensics search, found they were counterfeit, turned it over to the cops. Cops did the same thing, the undercover purchase. And so they had probable cause for the search warrant. The judge wanted to them to use a filter team and to waive that they would not rely on plain view. And what that is, it's restrictions saying, I'm going to search for counterfeit goods and evidence here. If I see child porn over here, not going to touch it, not going to notify anybody. I'm going to give the counterfeit good stuff to here. I'm going to destroy this stuff, and I'm going to give Kunis back his computer. Um, the government said, no, we're not going to agree to that. We want a written opinion. Give it to us. The judge magistrate did that, and the government's now appealed that, saying you can't restrict our, our search authorization as we go through this. Um, so it'll be an interesting aspect to see. The comprehensive drug testing put five requirements in there, some of which are the filter and the not reliance on the plain view. That was in the majority opinion, but then they issued another opinion, and that went to a, a concurring opinion. Some folks are saying, okay, that's not binding now. Other lawyers are saying, no, it, it's just, it doesn't say it prohibits it. We can still put restrictions on there for, for what they're going to do. Um, this particular case was the same situation um, that we talk about the facts of how cops do things. Um, the defense in this case were uh, basically um, counterfe or not counterfeiting, but they were uh, running drugs. Um, they were um, charged with um, importing, uh, where's my charges, a controlled substance. So cops did what they normally do. They showed up at 7 a.m. in the morning with 10 cops, knocked on the door, waited three seconds and rammed it down, bursting in, guns blazing as cops would do. Mirandized them, did the search, seized a bunch of stuff. They seized computers, but it was a drug crime. And the seizure of the computers was outside the scope of the search warrant. And so at the hearing, the motion to suppress it, um, the judge said, hey, you know, the government can seize this point. You, you didn't even raise it was there, so we're going to kick it out. Going back to that Ditka, Ditka aspect on life, um, this is stuff that lawyers are going to grab onto. They said there's no question that computers are capable of storing immense amounts of information, a great deal of privacy information. Searches of computers, therefore, often involve a degree of intrusiveness much greater in quantity, if not different, from other kinds of containers. Again, this is stuff that people are going to be grabbing onto to limit the aspect and the amount of searches that are going on in computers. Um, the reason I got this case here is mostly because uh, uh, the president uh, in Chefs versus Pachecas, not an endorsement again, he's the founder of access to go um, a telecommunications company, and they put Spectre Pro on his systems. Um, and so he sued, and it said, nope, acceptable use policy. The manual says you're going to be doing this. And, and so he had no expectation of privacy on this, uh, and the case was dismissed. U.S. v. Hamilton, a public employee again, same thing. Except use policy and banners, you have no expectation of privacy. So those are your cases coming out on, on workplace mo monitoring. Thank God I covered Nozzle already. Cotterman, uh, I'm going through quickly because uh, i got about seven minutes left. Cotterman came across the border. His name came up for, because he had done heinous crimes to, to, to minors in the back. He comes across with his wife. There's computers in there. They run the name search. So he comes up hot for these things. Two computers. Uh, photographic equipment coming across the border, uh, probably Nogales, uh, near Tucson. Uh, and so they seize uh, the equipment, but they don't have the computer forensics equipment to search it at the border. So they take it 170 miles away to Tucson. Uh, Cotterman has business in Tucson, so uh, he, he says, okay, go ahead and take it. Um, while they're looking at it, they need a password for it. Cotterman says, uh, I have to get it to you. Some other people use the computer. Uh, so the next day, he's supposed to come in with his wife to give him the password. Um, the wife shows up to get the other computer that was there. Um, and, and basically, uh, Mr. Cotterman has decided to, uh, as all innocent people do, uh, boards a flight from Mexico heading to uh, where all guilty people or innocent people go, Sydney, Australia. Um, so uh, they get around the password, find the photos of child pornography, bring them back, 
And he's saying uh, you couldn't take the evidence from the border. You needed a reasonable suspicion, uh, so they want it suppressed. And the judge court said, nope, Supreme Court recognizes a thorough search of property under the border search power does not implicate your, your privacy rights. And uh, I like this part kind of more for a travel aspect. Court has indicated uh, that travelers should expect intrusions and delays in order to satisfy the government's sovereign interest in protecting our borders from those who would wish to do us harm. So they said, you know, the border aspect on life, that can move um, up to Tucson for that. Um, intrusions and crimes. We touched upon this a little earlier. Um, this was going to be big last year um, at my talk because of some aspects on how some crimes were reported and who responded to investigate them. Again, when you have an unauthorized access to your computer, that's a crime. By statute, and, and the authority aspects on life go, you know, statutes are right at the top. You're supposed to investigate. If you have a crime, law enforcement's supposed to investigate, and, and by statute, that can rest also with the FBI. Department of Homeland Security statute, they have a statute that refers to the U.S. CERT. Um, the Homeland Security Act sets out what their responsibilities are. But the closest thing they're going to get is what is a PD, a presidential directive. And that presidential directive says, hey, Secretary of uh, DHS, you're to coordinate the collaboration uh, of this, work with the private sector, and, and support Department of Justice. So, so basically you've got, you know, DOJ is the folks who investigate your crime. As part of kind of uh, uh, everyone running around saying the sky is falling, and typically most of the people are running around saying the sky is falling, are, are the people who have been in government, leave government, work for a company that is going to sell services back to the government, and so they're saying, hey, the sky is falling. Um, the recent uh, uh, CEO, or, uh, yes, uh, CIO for the government just left, and he warned about the IT cartels. Um, myth of the super user. Paul Ohm wrote uh, what I thought was a, a good article in terms of who are these super users and what harm could they cause the Internet, and, and it lays out some aspects that kind of dispels uh, the, the theory of uh, the sky is falling, um, and then I get hit with all this stuff. Uh, you know, you're like, okay, wait, you kidding me? Again, um, I, I don't think the sky is falling, but I'm going to leave with some last aspects. My entire career, I've heard for, we need a call for new authorities. Uh, I, and I'm like, okay, new authorities, what is it you want to do? Well, I, I, don't, I don't come up with that. I don't think about that because I need new authorities for it. No, no, no. Tell me what it is you want to do. So what you need to do is get your attorneys involved early and often. That's an attorney's job. If you get me involved late, if you're going to deploy a, you know, an SSL device that's going to set personally identifiable information, and the first time you're going to tell your attorney is at a board meeting or something where you're telling the leadership of your company, here's what we're going to do, I'll tell you right now, as an attorney, I'm going to say, I'm going to go, whoa, no, you're not. You're going to start monitoring encrypted data going out of our pipes and intercept that? Whoa, no, time out. That's a no, no way. You don't want your lawyers to be naysayers. You need to get them involved early and often so as you're going along, they understand the one and the zeros and you explain it to them. And, and, I, and I know this hasn't caught on, but Clark's law, uh, contrary to Moore's law and Metcalf's law, Clark's law is you've got to take the technology and explain it to your attorneys at a third grade level so they can understand it. Because I've got to turn around and explain it to a judge or a jury or senior leadership at a first grade level. <laughs> so that's how it goes, folks. Now, one of the other aspects. Again, I've been very fortunate to have some wonderful training in this field, and I have a passion for learning the technology aspect of it. Lawyers are trained to hopefully ask the right question. They will take an interest in what you do. And what I've found from you folks is that when people take an interest in what you do, you do want to tell them what you're doing. Steve Chabinski from FBI said, you've got to be careful. You'll tell me day one you're deploying this device here, and we get to day 180, and you've changed the configuration for what you're doing on it. Keep your attorneys involved for what you're doing on that. The cyber Pearl Harbor, that's a, kind of the, the aspect of the sky is falling you know, part on life uh, on that. I'm going to kind of conclude with words matter. Um, the RFC has definitions for events, incidents, intrusions, and attacks. So you pick the right word that relates to that. DOD has definitions for each one of those. From my perspective, it's very important. We hear the word attack all the time, cyber attack. From what I understand, there has never been a cyber attack on the United States. That requires a presidential determination, and who's going to respond changes dramatically. So when you, I understand it's not as sexy, and nobody's going to pick up the front page of the Washington Post if it says, so-and-so suffers you know, cyber intrusion. Uh, I understand that. But words do matter um, from where we come from uh, on a legal perspective, so be clear and concise when you're working with your lawyers. 
Uh, I have all 30 seconds if there's any questions before they're going to kick me off the stage. Question? I tell you what, um, if you have questions, because I'm going to be kicked off the stage, come on over here. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll be right over here and I will be glad to answer the questions you have for that. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot, Bob.